we're live. We're live. Legacy. All right, man. We're here. This is incredible. We made yes. it. Sunday, yeah. Fonday, the House of Pain. <laughs> love it. I love love it. it. So, why are we here is one thing. All right. Um, <sighs> I, uh, I'll, 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 I'll be honest. There's a lot of people that walk into my gym and that I meet, and you know, all, all the time, right? Like it happens constantly. But there's certain individuals that you just immediately connect with. And you're one of those individuals. Like, I'll never forget the day I met you and the workout that we had. And just, I walked away from that workout, not about the workout, but I walked away from the, from the small conversation, then the, the just intentional conversation, the meaningful conversation that we had during that entire workout. It was during the, uh, the pandemic. Yes. And so we both spoke a lot about freedom and faith and favor and, and uh, it just really resonated with me. And at the end of the day, to me, that's why we're sitting in the, in the room where we obviously developed a friendship. You've, you know, been uh, worldwide lately. And so I'd love to tap into that. But, um, but I just want you to know, it's an honor to sit with you. And I think that uh, you, have, you have only touched the surface of your capabilities of reaching the world in a positive way. Um, you have a very, a very gifted way of speaking. Um, it's very unique. Uh, your 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 eye contact, your your uh, enthusiasm about life and about where you're trying to go is very prevalent. It's very obvious, and I think it's contagious. And I think people want that. And so when you come around, you're adding value. So you've added value to my life, and uh, and I hope you know I've done the same. So. Uh, and so, so many thanks ways. for doing this, man. I yeah, appreciate it. Ple pleasure and honor. And, and uh, you know, we, we have Alex to, to thank for the introduction. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so shout out to him. And, and just the amazing synergy of us three working out in an otherwise kind of grim time period, right? Where there Correct. was a lot of fear over faith. There was division. There was uncertainty. People were losing their jobs. People were getting sick. There was this, this narrative that was being spread to basically poison the minds of, of millions of people worldwide and the common core collective of us coming together on those morning workouts was really a bastion of, of safeguard and positivity against that and, and we were able to create our own narrative and kind of uh, be crusaders of the light through that otherwise dark and, and kind of morose time right and um, <clears throat> just the intensity of those workouts were completely savage and just bringing ourselves to the sheer state of mental, physical, emotional, spiritual collapse every morning was a perfect reset to rebuild ourselves, right? Like take what worry, stress, anxiety, uh, what had happened the day before and just throw it all away in the form of blood and sweat equity and pouring it out on the, uh, the former legacy yeah, fit pit exactly. sleigh station, which was the old location. And now you got this beautiful brand new state of the art location that has been just a, a, a catalyst to an even greater heights of unlocking human potential. And uh, I was telling you before, you know, just in the couple of weeks that I've, I've been able to work out here, it's just such a gift to be around a collective like-minded group of people who are all trying to get better and improve right. the lives of one another. Because what we can do here, we can spread to the rest of the world. Amen. And that common consciousness is uh, going to be a universal consciousness. Some of right? your, uh, tell, tell us uh, some of your physical, um, results from yeah, doing yeah that. precisely so so went to the bio station and, and very dialed in with you know getting blood work and really just assessing my metrics um from an anatomical and physiological standpoint and uh you know went from 14 percent body fat down to eight percent body fat amazing only within really the last four or four and a half weeks you know and and 99% of that is coming here, shaking it up, you know, like going into the cold immersion tank after the workout, you know, it's something you don't want to do, but doing the hard things, doing the difficult things is a catalyst for, for taking on challenges in all aspects of life. For so sure. not only has it helped my physical um, body improve, you know, going from 14% down to 8% body fat, putting on at least six to eight pounds of lean skeletal muscle mass, but then second to that, it's improved my relationships, it's improved my focus uh, in all aspects of business, family, faith, you know? So, you know, super love, grateful I for that, I love hearing man. that, I love yeah. hearing that. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that because uh, when I hear you say it's actually helped your relationships yes. and outside the gym, I think many people don't, don't correlate physical working out and getting in the best shape of their life with the outside world, with the mental side, with your business, with your relationships. 
And just let's dive into that a little bit. I mean, for me, uh, fitness and, and working out has always been my anchor, right? It's been the thing that if I start my day with the hardest thing that I'm gonna do all day, then the rest of the day is gonna be easy, right? Yeah. It's gonna, you know, because stresses are gonna come, difficulties, obstacles, things are gonna come, but if you've already blood, sweat, and tears, and you know, busted your butt in the gym, gotten the sauna, dud the cold plunge, then the stresses that come after that are like, ah, eh, I got this. Yeah. And uh, how has that helped you? So yeah, it, it definitely does. It, it's, uh, it gives you that mental grit. I think grit is, is a, a word or, or a development um, from a physical, uh, emotional um, mindset standpoint that gives you the perseverant mentality to get through whatever life adversity is thrown your way. Um, and really the catalyst that, that working out in such a positive but intense environment like Legacy forges grit each and every day. And then you take that attribute and you apply it to all aspects of life. You know, you don't get the job that you wanted, you know, rather than fall in the downward spiral of depression or beat yourself up, you work on improving what you could have done better for the next interview. And because of grit, you don't quit, right? You keep pushing forward despite right. any circumstance or odd against you. So I think doing the hard things in the morning, A, gives you grit, B, releases you know serotonin and dopamine, all those neuro feel good chemicals. Right. So naturally you feel better. When you feel better, you look better. And you walk into a room and there's a certain radiant vibrational frequency that you exude and you attract people into your into your cipher, and yeah. and when you do that, that's where opportunities come to grow business, to you know make friendships, to 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 establish relationships with people that you know if you're operating at a low physical frequency, you're not going to obtain or have the opportunity to to, to I manifest. Say, I say it all the time that like you know one thing that it does is when you feel good, when you feel like your best. Yes. Then it you you give your best to others. Absolutely. Like when you don't feel good, when you are tired and weak and hurting and uh, frustrated, then you project that on others. But when you're feeling your you're, you're becoming your best self, you're feeling your best, then it's it's contagious. Like because Absolutely. you are operating, like you said, at such a higher frequency that people almost gravitate towards you. Yes. And then you're sharing that. So that's really important. Talk about a little bit about your what you do for a living. Okay. Because I think it's fascinating, first of all. Um, and I I want to learn more about what you I know we've talked briefly about stuff and I know certain things you can't talk about, but mm -hmm. uh, just let let our audience know, you know, what your uh, what your job entails and what you do, because I, I find it to be fascinating. Yeah, so, so, so the little C I know C about it. C so. Yeah, CEO and, and president of uh, GTH Consulting Group, um, strategic partner of Roman Sanford, and basically uh, am a risk mitigator and, and strategical planner for the movements in everyday life and protection of high net worth individuals um, on a global theater. Um, everyone from, you know, political individuals to you know, um, fintech investors to hedge fund managers, um, the individuals that may have pervasive threats to their lives or their family members' lives. Um, and we act as a buffer and, and kind of warriors of the light to safeguard them from, you know, the evils that that, that roam, you know, unchecked right. and a lot of times directly threaten these, these people and their families. And so what we do is we safeguard them um, through a, a variety of different services. And uh, in, in that, we, we help people execute and enable their missions as some of the most powerful corporate executives in the world. Um, and, and I only operate with people that are literally positively affecting massive change and effect and creating real world solutions to real world problems on a day to day basis. And because of that, they threaten some of the, we'll say, powers that be right. that are trying to undermine some of the freedoms that are trying to undermine really humanity in a lot of ways. And so I take a very strict Bushido approach to my lifestyle. Everything is intentional. You know, I start out with a daily vinyasa flow. I start out with a, a daily prayer, you know, to set my intentions for the day to, you know, to ask God and source and universe for the strength and the fortitude to battle adversity head on for the discernment to distinguish between friend and foe and to be a servant of, 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 of humanity, yeah. you know, each and every day. And just doing that, and then coming here gives me that empowerment. You know, it gives me that ability to 
know that whatever adversity is I face, I'm ready for, I'm prepared for, and I've got the best team around me, you know, spiritually, physically, uh, emotionally to support me in that crusade and, uh, you know, deliver a level of service that, that is Excelsior in the industry. And y'all just did, uh, you just did the security for the UFC event. We did UFC 287. Awesome. Awesome event. Incredible. Um, a very patriotic uh, event, a, an incredible, um, homage to an, an awesome fighter, Jorge Masvidal, who I have immense respect for, who, you know, 20 something year career starting Amazing. out in, in, in backyard Street fighting, yeah, exactly. like Kimbo slice, right. bare knuckle brawls in the backyards of Miami to rising to, to, to the BMF title what against Nate story. Diaz what a story. To, to being a world champ in the UFC. And what a story of what America and the freedoms that America has to offer as a Cuban immigrant. Um, can can give you and your family. And uh, I look forward to chopping it up with him and, and having those opportunities and those conversations because uh, his his story is, is something that needs to be shared. Um, and then Gilbert Burns, the Reno. I mean, amazing, phenomenal Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt who's evolved as a proficient striker and, and someone who closes the distance and puts on his opponents a barrage of pace and intensity that can't be matched. And so it was a bait. Him and, Bilal, him and Bilal is going to be yeah and so I was watching that fight you know I was, I was cage that. side but I was yeah. chopping it up with Chuck Liddell during the event you know no keeping way. my okay. my eyes and defensive awareness uh dialed in but Chuck and I had had had, had great conversation and dialogue um while I was on post just about the, the the fights and the commentation and how the UFC has evolved into really a global entity and it's the only professional sports organization that has that global presence and so you have big corporate institutions like Monster behind them. You know, they don't have a water sponsor. So, you know, man, no days off could be that perfect, perfect way to fuel premier alkaline hydration to these okay. athletes who need it. Yep. Who need it. Um, you know, as a fighter, one of those things is that you don't have the full opportunity to rehydrate the human brain. It takes 72 hours to rehydrate a human brain. And, and, and unfortunately, with the USADA and a lot of the athletic commissions, you don't have the ability of a Myers cocktail, you know, before weigh-in. You know, right. you cut all this weight. I remember weigh-ins where, you know, weight cuts where I cut 20 pounds in two, three days. I was literally having almost like borderline hallucinogenic experiences, <laughs> mind-altering experiences where my body and mind were separating and disassociating. So and, how, many, uh, how many fights have you done? So, so I've had eight fights total. Um, both combined in, in mixed martial arts as well as combat sambo. You know, in 2018, I had the opportunity to represent the United States and go to uh, Minsk, Belarus, and, and compete against some some world talent over there. Amazing. Uh, individuals from Russia, um, Belarus, Germany, Amsterdam, um, you know, uh, all of the European nations. And do you fight, you fight at light heavyweight or heavyweight? So so essentially, I've when I was over there, I fought at heavyweight. So a lot okay. of the guys, I was like 225. I was fighting guys that are on average 265 to yeah. 295. So gave up about like 40 to 45 pounds. But um, what I lacked in, I guess, maybe the, the body mass, I, I, I made up for in, in athleticism, speed, and just strategical planning. Right. Um, and I remember the first fight, I, I fought a guy from Monrovia, former uh, Soviet Union block country. And... Uh, you know, drew, drew kind of the wild card. And, and one of the things I utilized was just the, the strategic implementation of a low kick. I was like, all right, this guy just wants to stay in the middle and the center and just turn this fight into a phone booth slug fest. And yeah. I was like, I'm down for that. You know, I, I love to give and take and I love throwing down, biting down on the mouthpiece and just slinging leather with reckless abandon. But it's not a long term strategy that's <laughs> sustainable, right? And there's two things for getting certain when you're getting punched in the face. You damn sure as all don't get any prettier, you sure as all don't get any smarter. So yeah. I got to uh, preserve what little I got. And so with that being said, I uh, started to angle off. And in, in mixed martial arts and jujitsu and, 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 and any combat sport, if you could break down the base, break down the structure and create angles of attack on that adversary, then you could create a strategical game plan that's going to break the will and the body of that person. So that's what I did. So I'd pump the jab, pump the jab, circle away, and then low kick. Pump the jab, pump the jab, circle away, low kick. And then as soon as I would see those hands drop, as he bore in the weight of my low kick that chopped into the base of his leg like an ax to the base of a tree, I'd see his hands drop and I'd come upstairs with a 2-3-2. Two, two. He wound up shooting in, uh, goes in, and I'm like, oh, now you want to wrestle. Perfect. Welcome to my world. But you swim with the sharks. And so cinched up a nice guillotine. And the funny thing is, I was I was on one side, and his body was blocking the referee's vision of him tapping. And so, uh, you know, not by purpose, but, yeah, but so by, by fate, I had to put right? him asleep. I had to give him the option to tap, nap, or snap. Go. And he decided to take a nap. So long story short, 
Um, wound up making it to the semis and uh, lost to, to the Belarusian champion. Um, but it was one of those things, man. He had knocked out five people that day. It was Memorial Day weekend at the United States, American flag on my back. And there's like, there's no way in hell um, I'm either coming home on my shield or with my shield. Like, I'll take a concussion, I'll take an L, yeah. but I'm going down here and I'm throwing down with swift, violent efficiency. Wound up losing the, the battle. Um, won three fights that day and lost the last, the fourth. But, you know, came so home. So you actually fought four times in four one Four times day. in one day. Yeah, so pretty it was like wild. A, a, it, it basically like tournament. round robin yeah. tournament style. Do they yeah. do that? anymore or or is that mostly like overseas the the old school like pride format was yeah. like sometimes I remember, two yeah. yeah like the grand prix right yeah. where you, you'd, you'd fight twice and, and sometimes three were, times were like there was no time right yeah was yeah like, a lot of them were no time like the first crazy. round used to be like 10 minutes and then they would add an additional round but um long story short the most impressive feat was not watching the men it was watching the savage intensity of some of the female fighters oh yeah as they would get standing eight counts get their mouthpiece launched all the way across the the fighting surface throw it back in and go to battle three four five more times that day and wow. so the the warrior spirit that was demonstrated in that competition was amazing it was super inspiring you know got a podium spot as one of the first americans to do so um in the hand hand, hand combat uh world championships and so it was a great experience and it was memorial day weekend so it was uh it was an awesome opportunity to represent the fighting intense spirit of the american people and i had friends man i had friends like clients people that i thought believed in me literally being like gee you're gonna get your ass beat you know how tough the russian people are you know how tough the eastern europeans are and i'm like that's all all well and fine and and i agree with you but do not ever denounce or or overlook the fighting american spirit Amen. For as people with mere pitchforks, we dispose the largest empire the world had ever seen and the largest massive proficient continental fighting force in the British Army and King George III and the American Revolution. So don't get it twisted. If you think I'm just going to go over there and fold, you got another thing coming. I'm going to come home with some hardware. And I did. And I yeah. took souls. You know, I, I, I was able to win three fights and lost the last. But you know what? It was a great experience. That's amazing. You said the other day um, we were in the gym and you were talking about how you want to get back to that. Yes. Uh I don't know if you remember what you said, but it, it was real. It was very powerful what you said. Um, if you maybe you can recap it, but uh, so tell me why you want to fight again. Like what that? What's your why when it comes to fighting? Because I, you said it that morning, and it really spoke to me in terms of. I think people can actually apply it to life. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and uh, I, I can't remember exactly how you said it, but I'm gonna ask you now. So. Yeah, I, I, you know, I wanna get back in the ring and, and, and represent organizations like the We Defy Foundation that gives combat veterans who have lost limbs the ability to find purpose and tribe again through the art of jujitsu. I wanna be an inspiration for that organization. I wanna be an inspiration for PB Abate, an organization that represents the life of Matthew Abate, scout sniper, killed in Sangin province, Afghanistan, who led fearless his Marines on the field of battle and, and you know, reckless abandon to his life, walked through a minefield to, to, to carry one of his brothers off the battlefield as he was grievously wounded, went back and, and unfortunately succumbed to his circumstance. Uh, and now we run an a operation in the summer months in Paradise Valley, shout out to Torres, uh, where we take veterans into the mountains of uh, Montana and we do Muay Thai, we do Jiu Jitsu, mindfulness, yoga, um, and use it to create tribe, sense of purpose and sense of community every year. And so I wanna showcase those organizations and use my platform as a fighter to do so. Whether it be an international jujitsu competition or getting a fight with Titan FC and fighting at the Intercontinental here in our backyard of Miami. You know, rep companies I believe in that believe in me, like No Days Off, like yeah. Legacy Fit. You know, be a role model for my nephews to, you know, know that you can come from a pretty dark place and through grit, perseverance and self-improvement, like don't ever let anyone cast a shadow on your light and, and, and shine brighter than whatever adversity you're going through. Illuminate that darkness and, and, and don't ever for a second doubt your abilities. And so that would be the reason and the motivation why I, I do that as an inspiration for the single mom who's getting abused at home, for the kid with Down syndrome who's always told what he couldn't do, but now learns how to box and is empowered and knows me and sees me in TV. And now is like, man, I want to be like that guy. That's G, yeah. you know, like I know him, I trained with him, you know? So that's why I'd want to get back and, you know, risk, risk my body, um, in the crucible of an MMA contest as an inspiration, because to me it's worth it. You know, yeah. just like representing the United States flag on my back was worth it going to Belarus, even when no one thought I'd be able to be victorious and people were telling me I was going to get knocked out.
I love it. I love yeah. it. No, it's, it's very inspiring. Um, a lot of purpose behind the pain, right? You know, so um, really love that. Uh, you brought a book. Yes. Um, read that quote that you talked about yeah. uh, before we started. So, so this is a book, um, Warrior Wisdom, Ageless Wisdom for the Modern Warrior by Bodie Sanders, PhD. Um, and it, it's kind of a, uh, a compilation of different quotes from different philosophers, you know, Sun Tzu, um, you know, Musashi, and, you know, much like the Bhagavad Gita uh, that I had by my bedside as a kid and when things were tumultuous or uncertain or I had fear or anxiety, I would open it up and it would always fall to the right page at the right time and it would always give me some inspirational wisdom for whatever situation I was going through. And so actually driving over here today, I did that exact practice. And the page that it opened up to, which is 125, which I think is a powerful number, and the quote is this, only one who continually re-examines himself and corrects his faults will grow. I'll read that again. Only one who continually re-examines himself and corrects his faults will grow. The Hagakuri. I love that. It's, it's very on, on brand for me. You know, the quote is, uh, you know, our, our quote, the no days off. No days off is never taking a day off on you. It's a commitment to becoming your best self. And I think the only way you can become your best self is by correcting yourself. And that never stops. Like you should never stop learning. You should never stop correcting. And a lot of that uh, comes with intentionality. A lot of that comes with self-awareness. Like another thing that I feel like a lot of people are not doing enough is like recognize your own bullshit, right? Yes. Recognize you know, when you are acting a certain way that is not positive, you know? Like we all do it. We yeah. all are messed up yeah. individuals. Yes. We all have bad days. Mm -hmm. We all have bad attitudes sometimes, but you can make a decision to change that. Absolutely. You can make a choice to not operate in anger, to yes. not operate in resentment, to not operate with uh, jealousy. Mm -hmm. You can actually operate from a standpoint of, 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 uh, a higher potential yes. for yourself and, and identify that and then lead with that. And oftentimes that comes with the things that we tell ourselves. And there was another quote in there talking about that. Uh, you know, the things that we tell ourselves daily is who we are becoming. And that's the direction that we're going to take. But if you're speaking negative to yourself constantly and 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 even if your circle is speaking negative because a lot of times a lot of times people are surrounded by I, you know, there's a good book called surrounded by idiots i don't know if you've yeah. read it it's yes. really good and uh and it just talks about like people you have to protect your circle you, you can't to. just have people speaking negative thoughts because they're going through bad stuff and they want you, you know, misery loves company, that whole Absolutely. thing. I've been saying it a lot the last two weeks, like you can't let the, the, the intrusive thoughts of negativity of your external circumstance, your external environment, poison and plague your mindset because it has a ripple effect. It literally will start epigenetically wiring every cell in your body to do the same thing and go through that default programming which then in turn lowers your vibrational frequency right. and it shuts off your light. It literally snuffs out your ultimate human potential as, as a creature of the light, as, as a creature of energy, as someone who is positive, we owe it to ourselves, to God, to those who came before us, to our friends, to our families, to be the highest version of ourselves day in and day out. And everyone goes through adversity, but we need to create, you know, a safety net and we need to create daily habitual routines so that we don't let those thoughts of negativity intrude our minds and then radiate out to the external people mm -hmm. that need us the most. And that's why you need books like that. That's why you need the Bible. That's yes. why you need prayer. Absolutely. One of my favorite uh, devotionals is My Utmost for His Highest mm -hmm. by Oswald Chambers. Yes. And it's very, very powerful. And I've been reading it since I was like in seventh grade. And again, we become what we read, what we, read what we, we say, yes. what we think. And so if you're not reading things, this is what I feel like a lot of people are doing. They go through life 
they're listening to music, they're watching Netflix, they're distracting they're, themselves. They're, you know, doing a caddy talk, you know, yes. at work. And they're just going through this life of like, kind of, uh, you know, like it doesn't matter. Like it's a joke. Yeah, like it's a Not joke. Not playing it as a serious game that it is. Exactly. And then they wonder why they're depressed, why they're fat, why they're, you know, no energy, why, you know what I mean? So it's like, it, it starts, I love what you said. It starts with your routine. It starts with the rituals because your routine and rituals turn into these daily habits. And, and recognizing like we're the master and commanders of our fate and our soul and, and the internal loci of control, the power that is in all of us, the God that is in all of us is such a beautiful gift. Our presence is the ultimate present to all those around us, but only if we're operating at the highest level of positive vibrational frequencies. And the only way we can do that is to set an intentional course of our day. And so the first thing literally is to dive to the edge of my bed and pray for another day, for the gift of gratitude, for the gift of life. And by doing that, even if I am dealing with some sort of external circumstance, even if I am inside my own head, because the space between these two cauliflower ears has been the most formidable battlefield I've ever been in. Way greater than a cage, way greater than a ring. But if we can start with a heart full of gratitude, then we literally elevate our frequency and we operate under the guise of appreciation. And so few people operate with a heart full of gratitude. Gratitude is the ultimate attitude. It is one of the most cataclysmically changing things that'll put you on a course of positive trajectory. But it could also be one of the most detrimental things if you don't express it. Um, and recently, you know, happens a lot. I'm always trying to improve. I'm always trying to of course, socially grow. But with that being said, don't get inside your own head when the external people around you don't give the feedback that either A, strokes your ego or makes you feel good or we oftentimes have higher expectations for those around us than we do ourselves. Right. And we sell ourselves short because of that. We're so worried about the external gratitude or appreciation or validation from others that we don't give ourselves our own validation. Right. And that is really what what starts the whole domino effect of of reaching your potential. Yeah, if I if I uh I would not be sitting here today if I was uh leaning on uh on the hand claps and the and the uh, the awards and the uh recognition you know, I say often that you, you know, it's, it's about what you're doing in, 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 in the dark, right? It, it's, it's when no one's watching. It's when there's no applause, you know, what, when are you actually, what are you doing solo? What are you doing when no one sees you? Are you, you know, how do you speak to strangers? How do you speak to the waitress? How do you, how do you do things in the dark? Like, it's it's uh it's something that if you're not being intentional about if you're if you're only doing things for the applause if you're only doing things for the recognition then you're you're probably not going to go very far in life and and we live in such a instantly gratified society with the advents of technologies which are good they give you the opportunity to have global connectivity they give you the opportunity to create a brand or a startup with very little overhead right i.e social media facebook instagram right. linkedin but what they also do is they breed an unbelievably inflated level of self-comparison. And they denature a lot of times our own self-belief and self-efficacy. 100%. I think that, you know, you spoke about gratitude and being grateful. But when you're living in a comparison world where everyone is posting the highlight reel of their life and you're sitting there watching it saying, man, I want to be... I want to be on vacation. I want to have that body. I want to lift that much weight. I want to, I want to do this. I want to do that. Then it's very hard to be grateful for where you are yes. while you're comparing something that most of the time is a lie. Yeah. And most of the time they're not even living what they, they supposedly are living. Then you're, you know, again, it's just that negative connotation instead of one thing that I say often and my brother and I were talking about the other day is like, be grateful where you are while you pursue where you want to go. Yes. It's, it's okay to want to do more, to want to be more, to want to achieve more, but be grateful for where you are because if you are becoming and you're getting better every day and you're changing every day for the better, well, remember like two years ago, 
you've come along where you are today two years ago you weren't there yeah so it's like let's not forget where we were two years ago and yeah. that you are making progress and celebrate the progress exactly. you know and i'm guilty of this like oh, me i'm too. I'm 100 so guilty, guilty of not of, celebrating my wins yeah like i'll give you an example when we opened this place april 1st uh you know very exciting very encouraging time we open the building and i'm literally on the phone negotiating the next location literally yeah and yeah. that you know that's not really that healthy i think it's good obviously because you know that's the goal right is to keep opening new locations but i think i have to remind myself to celebrate these wins Absolutely. and to celebrate where i am while i'm building the empire you know yeah it, that's a twofold um philosophy that is so important and, and celebrate the small victories no matter what it is like you know, meeting a, a new friend who shares the same common interest in fitness or nutrition or hydration, that's a huge victory because that's going to open up. If you express the acknowledgement of that victory with a heart full of gratitude, you literally can change your life in such a radical way. So I think like gratitude is like the ultimate multivitamin for self-improvement and reaching a state of your ultimate human potential. And without that, you block the gifts that God and the universe have to, to, to behold for you, right? Right. And, and uh, it's easy to do that. I remember I won the, the Pan American Championships in Jiu Jitsu and, you know, I was so fixated on the fact that I didn't get a submission and, and I didn't finish one of my adversaries. And, and then in the absolute, you know, I had a back and forth battle and only placed you know, uh, second, I didn't get gold in both divisions. And I remember being so like frustrated with that. I hit up my boy, Todd Mukenheim, and I was like, yo, let's go train. Like meet at the UFC gym in 25 minutes, jumped off the Long Island Railroad, went straight to New Hyde Park yeah. and worked on that submission and, and worked on that takedown so that the next time that would never happen. And I think that self-critical lens is very important to never settle and always seek perfection. But to also realize and give yourself credit that perfection is an hallucinatory, esoteric thing a lot of times. We're never gonna be perfect in every metric, but we have to achieve manageable objectives and small little goals and then celebrate those small little victories. Because if not, we're not grateful for the work. We're not right. grateful for what we've achieved. And then we shut off the next blessing. And um, it's, it's like the Japanese Kaizen philosophy of get 1% better each and every day. Rome wasn't built overnight. I certainly didn't get my black belt overnight, right? I remember on that journey, on that discourse to getting my black belt, how fixated I became on, on getting the next stripe or getting the next belt color. And there was a point halfway through my journey when I was a purple belt and I couldn't wait to get my brown belt that I almost lost interest. I lost passion for why I was doing it in the first place. And it almost caused me to be like, why am I doing this if all I care about is the acknowledgement or the recognition? Right. That's the wrong way to do anything. Yeah. You gotta do it because you know purposefully in your heart of hearts that what you're doing is gonna better humanity. And I think when you have that as your motivating factor, you know, like, uh, you know, if, 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 you, if you have a why, you can overcome any how, right? Oh, 100%, yeah. Progress over perfection all day. Um, you know, I, I think I had a guy ask me to, uh, to just, if he could just talk to me, you know, I swear, you know, I get this, lately I've been getting this a lot. Yes. You know, getting DMs or emails of like, hey, can I, can I just sit down and talk to you? Yeah. You know? And sometimes, you know, I, I, I won't engage, you know, mm -hmm. cause these are, you know, strangers and time is valuable, what yes. have you. But he reached out about three times and okay. I was like, you know what? I like, I like persistence. Yes. I, I think yeah. that's positive and uh, let me give him a shot, you know? And he came in my office and uh, we talked and he was asking me, you know, how, basically he just, he was about 34 years old in the fitness industry. And he was like, just, how did you get where you are today? And one of the things that I tell people all the time is that it's not, there's no magic. There's no like blueprint. It literally is showing up for yourself every single day and you never stop doing that. And then when it becomes in the fitness industry, if you're serving, if you're a coach, if you're a personal trainer, if you're a jujitsu instructor or what have you, we don't get days off. No, you do not. You do not cancel an appointment. No. You do not get sick. No. You do not get injured. I have trained over the last 20 years 
and running a business, but also being a personal trainer, I have done it with a broken back, a torn, you know, torn muscles yes. with vertigo, with migraine headaches, with COVID. Yeah. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like with yeah. whatever, whatever I do not call out. Yes. I do not take days off because we're in the service industry and they expect you to be, and it's brutal and it's hard. It is. But if you want to ask me, how am I sitting here today? How are you sitting here with six locations and a brand and a beverage company, an apparel company? The reason is because I always show up. And there's so many people right now in this industry that are taking days off on their clients and on their members or their students, and they don't understand why they're not growing in the business. The business is about commitment. It's a consistent commitment to others, not yourself. Yes. We are in the service industry. That, that's it. Like if you don't understand that you're in the service industry, then you're not going to go very far in this industry. And the fitness and wellness, and, and I always tie in martial arts because I think there's such a synergy there. Yes. You know, I've heard a lot of people talk about it. Jocko talks about it a lot that, that like the foundation of martial, martial arts is actually, he would rather have that than, than working out. Like it, it's yeah. so... The, great for the, the mind. The, and the term body. samurai is is one who serves. The, the the samurai were the feudal protectors of Japanese shoguns. You know, their whole existence was predicated upon living a moral code of integrity, of honesty, of righteousness, of selfless service and sacrifice to their shogun and the people of Japan. And I was blessed to, 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 to be raised with that philosophy, you Amazing. know, to learn Ishinru, the Japanese karate style, um, when I was three, four years old, to practice kendo in the backyard with my brother, to, to have these pillars instilled and ingrained in me in such a young age. And I had a beautiful conversation before this podcast with a, a new found friend from Hawaii, an amazing person who used to compete in the WWE actually as a no WWE way. diva. And I know she's going to be a, a friend for life, but we were talking about the better betterments of martial arts in the schools. What we need and, and what we really need to roll out, and this is a huge conviction of mine and something I will roll out, yeah. is a basic understanding of martial arts for K through 12, so that just like we used to have the presidential challenge in gym class, where we were taught to set the bar high and meet certain physical you know, prerequisites. Right. I want to do that with the martial arts. Give people the the ability to know how to self-defend. Give people the ability to know if someone's getting picked on or bullied, how to stick up for that person. Give someone the confidence that if they're at home and they've got an abusive family member or parent, to, to draw the line in the sand and defend themselves right. so that their screams no longer fall on deaf ears. And martial arts is such a great catalyst of empowerment. You know, you, you take some of the dictators throughout history. I guarantee if I took Hitler and smashed him on a jujitsu mat for three years straight, that guy never would have raised his elevated narcissism and ego to the, to the, the, the way that he did to then ostracize an entire community of people. Uh, it hammers out ego and it brings and fosters about humanity. And that is what we need in society. That's actually, I mean, say that again, because that, that is, it, exactly what you just said. You yeah. need to say that like louder. Mar <laughs> martial arts hammers out and denatures the ego and it brings about and forges humanity. 100%. That's a, such a, I mean, that should be a quote. No, we need to tweet that later. Um, uh, one of my required reading for, for my staff is ego is the enemy. Yes. And a lot of my, a lot Ryan, of my Ryan holiday. Yeah. yeah. So I have it right by my bed. Know, so good. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, listen, we all have it. Like we all have a, a very, especially alpha males, we all have a very strong ego, but I think there's something to be said about being strong, but still being, having humility and ha and being humble with it. Yes. And, and it's almost makes you even more of a badass, you know, like when you can control it and that's what martial arts to me does is that it's not about the toughest guy or the, you know, it, it, it's literally about controlling the anger you know some so. of the most beautiful human interactions that i've ever seen took place in fort myers beach after the most recent hurricane and we you know rolled into basically this trailer park community that was completely devastated and, and decimated by the hurricane and just 
in disarray to the point where it looked like it was carpet bombed. And we, we show up to this this um, little trailer park and it's it's an 85 year old couple. And, you know, they literally are like trembling and holding each other and, mm. you know, tell us about the night before how they prayed to God that the water level would stop so that it didn't rise above their mouths and drown them together as they clung for safety and the avoidance of hypothermia. And when we went to their trailer, you know, I was with the SEAL, uh, two Rangers, you know, ferocious warriors of the highest caliber. And to see these individuals, you know, and myself get down on our knees and apply first aid to the, the elderly gentleman's foot that was bleeding profusely. And, you know, simple things like moving their refrigerator from the kitchen so they had a safe passage to walk to and from the bathroom and holding them as they expressed, you know, the traumas that they had seen the night before. Um, was such a beautiful instance of humanity and it continued for the you know two weeks that i was out there and then i i wound up working there for another about month but just organizations like that like aerial recovery group that go into war-torn areas i.e ukraine go into disaster zones and literally bring about the easing of human suffering and showcase humanity at the highest level. Go to Turkey and dig for the bodies of family members and young children who are entrapped in rubble and pour their heart and soul into the rescue effort, you know, on their own dime, mind you. And so that to me has been such a purposeful existence. And I've learned more from that organization than man, any year Which organization of formal is this education. And this is Aerial Recovery Group. Um, founded by Jeremy Locke and Brittany Turner, based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. And it's a disaster response organization that essentially trains, equips uh, search and rescue operators to deploy globally to bring rhyme and reason, um, end confusion, and bring medical, first aid, water, food, uh, structure to complete chaos and destruction and um, help save lives and eliminate confusion while they do so. And so um, what I will say is, is the ultimate mark of a warrior is not, you know, how many lives you can take on the battlefield. It's having those skill sets of knowing violence, but also knowing when to use it and when not to use it. But right. more than anything else, um, showing humanitarian compassion and taking care of the disenfranchised, taking care of the less fortunate, taking care of the people in the most adverse circumstance, giving them hope, ending their suffering and saving their lives. And so that to me is the ultimate mark of a warrior. You have to have the duality of both. Just because you could swing a sword and run it through the, the bodies of a thousand enemies doesn't mean you're a warrior. That means you're, you know, could potentially just be a bloodthirsty individual. You have to have the duality of being proficient in violence if necessary, to protect innocence from the darkness of evil. But then on the other side of that, you have to have the skill sets and the abilities and the yearning desire to help humanity in all facets. And if you have that, then, and only then, can you call yourself that yeah. warrior. And today we live in a society where everyone, you know, wants to, 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 to self-promote and self-aggrandize and talk shit from the keyboard, right? And right. be these keyboard, keyboard crusaders. Warriors. Many out there. And unfortunately it's a societal um, epidemic. And all I will say is that I know for a fact that martial arts is is one of the ways to eradicate that issue. Yeah, I 100% um, agree. I also, I mean, I, you know, martial arts, but then also to fitness, man. Like I fitness, think that- Exactly, yeah. I think that men, like men out there, you know, you guys need to, if you're not lifting weights, if you're not, Build, getting stronger, then you're missing out you're missing on out. your best yeah. self. Like every single man and really woman in general, everyone should be lifting weights. It, it is, it's such, you know, strength is such a foundation of life. And, and, you know, we don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. Like we really don't. You don't know when you need to protect your family, when you need the strength. And it's just such a, it should be really a staple in everyone's life. A hundred percent. And and secondly, uh, a nutrition, you know, it's like strength and then nutrition. And it, it's, it's, I don't understand why people are not. And I think there's been a heightened sense of awareness of this lately, but you know, the things you put on your body matter. You know, that was one of the main reasons I did the water is that, you know, not all waters are the same. You no. know, not all water is, 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 uh, is uh, good for you and and i really wanted to have something that i could that i could back and have a and have a, a platform 
to be able to give people proper hydration. And I think that, you know, let's talk a little bit about just uh, what it is to be an alpha male, what it is to, to really stand for something, you know, because I think that's missing in, in today's, uh, unfortunately. And, and again, we're sitting here, so I know there's people out there that believe what we believe. Yes. Uh, but I think, uh, and I think we all need to, to rally together also and, and find each other and connect with each other and celebrate each other. Um, Cause I feel like uh, we're the tight, we're the quiet, we're the quiet, humble, silent crowd that just yes. moves, moves silently. And I think it's time that we actually speak up. And I think yeah. it's time that we actually uh, become the loudest person in the room to a certain extent, a certain because extent. we've reached a point where freedom and faith are being, you know, infringed upon. Exactly. And yeah. it's something that we should not take lightly at no, all. No. And it's something that we, we really need to put our foot in the ground and say, no, this is how actually, because there's, there's just a disconnect right now on, on why can't discipline, discipline be, be one of our like pillars, pillars that we, you know, like it's like discipline is frowned upon. Like, yeah. no, it shouldn't be. It actually should be the, one of the first things that you should lean into. So, you know, from your perspective, like, what do you think we, we could do in terms of uh, getting that, that, that message out there more? Yeah, so, and this is a commonly used quote to describe that exact, you know, paradigm and, and predicament in a lot of ways. And it's, you know, evil prevails when good men stand by and do nothing. I mean, look at Nazi occupied Germany, you know? When, when you, sit by maybe out of humility and you don't speak up and I'm guilty of it too. I'm very low key and, and una, unassuming in the sense that I don't often vocalize out of maybe not wanting to rub anyone the wrong way, but that silent band of alphas needs to start voicing themselves and doing so, so that they can inspire the next generation to let people know that being a man is a good thing. It's not toxic. Being someone who works to, to improve their mind and body and is a good son, is a good uncle, is a good father, you know, is strong and, and takes care of his body and dials in his nutrition and proper hydration and treats the members of his community with respect and, and is an asset, not a liability. I think that's what it really comes down to. Be physically fit, work out hard, like manage your finances, be the best version of yourself every single day take no days off and optimize yourself because it's the only way you're going to be of service to those around you and the ultimate mark of a man the ultimate mark of an alpha male is how he treats others how how his presence makes those around him feel and i mean that to me is is what it's all about like what will those who knew you best say about you when you take your last and final breath. How will you be remembered? How will you be remembered? Your legacy. How, what you is know? your legacy? What and is I, your legacy? I'm so tired of hearing like these professional athletes talking about their legacy doesn't matter. And oh, I don't care about legacy. Like, listen, everyone on this earth should care about their legacy. It is, it is all we have. Yes. Like, how will you be remembered? Or will you just be forgotten? Yeah. And it's like, I want to leave a mark on the world that is positive and that will last a lifetime, will last beyond a lifetime. Eternity, that, yeah. That'll beyond, you know, eternity, yeah. like you said. And I, I just think it starts with, you got to be intentional in everything. Like it, we talk about it often, but if you're not being intentional with your life, then you're not going to go very far in life. So, yeah. oh, Cheers, brother. Yes, sir. Hydration. NDO H2O, people. Oh, love it. Premier premium hydration. So before the break, you were um, you were asking me a question. Uh, so ask it to me again. Um, so it, it kind of keynotes on something we already spoke about, which is um, you know maintaining your internal loci of control, right? Controlling your thoughts, not letting intrusive feelings or emotions permeate into the depths of your consciousness and subconsciousness, right? Well. Addressing those emotions, of course, not, don't just disregard them or lock them in a box, but let them pass through you as you process them, right? A lot of times people ruminate over a concept or an idea, right. or they set an expectation on how someone else's behavior is going to affect them. 
And then they, they, they focus on that. I example, right? You text a friend that you've been there for in the past and he doesn't respond. You call that same friend who you've always been there for and he doesn't pick up the phone. A lot of times we get in the habit of like, man, that, that, that's crushing or that makes me feel a certain emotional way. But in actuality, I think uh, what we really should do is realize that everyone is writing their own plot to their own movie story, right? And sometimes we're cast in as characters and sometimes we're not and that's okay. A lot of times though, it's just a matter of people being so busy and simply not having the opportunity to respond to the text or the phone call. And then also the third part of that is, um, you know, people wanting to give you an ample amount of time and knowing that the short frame that they have isn't enough to respond to that text message or phone call. So I think giving people those tools to like not take it personally when they don't get the expectation that they envision from those around them. But what have been some strategies to not let the external circumstances of life or interactions or variables outside of your control infiltrate and pollute your own mindset yeah. and cause you to take a negative tone? I think one of the main things is that it has to start with the thought that it's not about you. So often like, you know, when we were younger, in our 20s, we thought everything was about us, right? Our egos were out of control. Yes. You know, everything was about us. And the older I get, I'm starting to realize that it's not about me. Like, and especially when it comes to business, because, you know, find a cause greater than yourself and then do everything in your power to accelerate the cause. Not what is you know, success or coming back to you in financial way, but no, like, are you accelerating what your purpose is, Bingo. not your passion, yeah. right? Because oftentimes to me, and I love passion, passion's great. Passion's I mean, great. we're, you know, like, I think both of us are very passionate people, but passion to me is associated with feelings, emotions, and where you are, whereas purpose, it doesn't, purpose doesn't matter. You show up regardless you show to the gym up, without how you, no how you feel what. or what your emotional state exactly. is. You put in the work because your purpose overrides any emotional constraint that may be holding you back from showing up for yourself and for showing up for others that align with that purpose and that mission. And so defining purpose is such a vital part of our human identity. And there's nothing more sad than to see someone who's lost that purpose. There's nothing more beautiful than reigniting that purpose. Right. Yep. And, and I think that is what fitness has the ability to do. You literally can take someone who's going through a divorce, who's lost their job, and through giving them a newfound state of purpose of self-improvement, give them a catalyst for change that takes them out of the most depressive, dark situation and illuminates a beautiful reset and restart to their life. And through that, they can really start to achieve the greatness within themselves. Yeah, it's like taking passion and motivation and replacing it with purpose and discipline. Boom. You know what I mean? Because yeah. there's so many people out there that they're relying on motivation. Uh, a certain song, a certain friend, a certain um, time of day, a certain time of month. So, like, I love it. You know, you always hear the people say, I'm going to start on Monday, you know? Yeah. And it's like, why can't you start today? Yeah. Or you wait know, till what, January 1st. Yeah. Or, I'm you know, January 1st, two I'm weeks of do... exercise exactly. and then fall off the bandwagon by February. And I think when you replace purpose and discipline, then it it's your decisions go beyond your feelings. Your decisions go beyond the emotion of it. And, and when you're committed to what you said you were gonna do long after the mood you set it in has left, then you're gonna slowly start to see positive change. And I would say there are a lot of people out there in, in a dark place, you know? And, and I think that oftentimes they're, they're just sitting there waiting for something to spark them at the end of the day, stop waiting and move and get up and go towards it and it will find you. Take you know? action now. Take action. Take action today. I read an Andrew Huberman quote that Samuel Ray Miller, mutual friend of Blue Tiger Wellness, uh, sent me this morning and it was talking about um, the ultimate ailment to the mind is essentially a lack of productivity. And this is in my own terms, my interpretation of the wisdom that was imparted upon me this morning. But 
what I mean by that is like people are so overly analytical and they create in themselves paralysis by analysis where they refuse to take any action because they wait, you know, like do now, like don't, don't wait for tomorrow. A lot do of now that comes what you can do. Assumptions and exp and false expectations, false expectations, right? Yeah. Because oftentimes people do, don't do something because they assume the outcome. When they're not even yeah. taking action to find out, to discover an well, outcome. Well, I tell you right now, man, and, and I still have fear and trepidations and full transparency of like branding myself with my martial arts content and filming my martial arts content and, and letting my voice be heard to, to humanity. And so right now you have my commitment that I'm not going to let fear or false expectations appearing real hold me back from that potential. And right, also we're going to shake on it right now. And also uh, to understand because, that... In your mistakes or in your, like, let's say you're, you know, you're putting yourself out there, right? And you're in, in your critiques, like all of that is positive. And it's There's wisdom. No, it's yeah. wisdom. Like when people are critiquing you or people are reminding you of what you did wrong or whatever, it's not a bad thing. No. Like construction, constructive criticism is actually a good thing because it's going to enable you to be better. And then here's the thing. These keyboard warriors out there talking about you, you know, you don't know what you're doing or you don't know. It doesn't matter. I, like it does not matter. Who gives a flying? Yeah. Who cares if some random dude in Iowa is texting you on a DMing you that you don't know what you're doing. Like who cares? Like absolutely yeah. who cares? I had, uh, I was on my boy, Nick Kumalastos, uh, podcast. Nick's a, a great friend and brother, jujitsu era recon Marine. And you know, I had this comment from some dude across the pond, some keyboard crusader. And it was like first big promotional podcast that I did. And you know, I forget what the, the, the nature of his commentary was, but I let it like plague me. I was like, yeah. man, it like was like a stiff, punch to the gut and i'm like what the heck am i doing letting some dude who would never have the cojones to get on a microphone and broadcast his thoughts and be vulnerable and be open why am i letting that affect me and it goes back to like what have you found as you've evolved as an entrepreneur as a father as a, a great mentor and friend to when you maybe find yourself falling into that negative self doubt or that 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 feedback where there's that you know switch where you feel some sort of trigger from an external circumstance what are the strategies that you use to combat that yeah i mean i would say the the number one thing my mom reminds me all the time and i'll get emotional I'm talking about it but uh the holy spirit is living in me right yes. so it's i have a very I call it like a sick intuition that is constantly speaking to me. Beautiful. That's not of me. Yes. And it's very hard to explain because yes. it's not of me. Yes. I often, <laughs> I've always said that I feel like an alien on this earth yes. because of how I think, because of the thoughts that go in my head. Mm -hmm. And so honestly, if I'm being like very transparent, like, I, I don't really have much negative thoughts uh, yeah. when it comes to my purpose. You know, I have negative thoughts, obviously, of, of uh, you know, my, the pain. I've been in pain most of my life with injuries and, and uh, I've had very, very tough relationships when it comes to, um, you know, I, I'm a giver, right? Yes. So I give and I give and I give and I give and I've had a lot of people, you know, shit on me. Yeah. And that's hard that's hard to uh to overcome but again when you have something inside of you that's not of yourself that you can that you can call on then it, it makes life a heck of a lot easier it right does. and um so for me it's uh staying in the word you know reading yes. and praying it's um being very intentional what i listen to um i'm right now i'm you know i, I think it's because of my age but because my my dad used to do this a lot, but it's like basically like worship music and yeah, country music. Beautiful, it's like, beautiful. it's like essentially most of the time that's all I listen Incredible. to. Incredible. Um, and, and there's something to be said about when you're listening to things that are speaking life into you, that it automatically reflects yes. out of you. And, uh, but you know, again, I'm not, I'm not some superhuman, And so I do have, I would say the dark moments, but it's amazing to me how 
fast. You know, because I fast it changes. Yeah, like, like you I, redirect. I, the other day, this actually, and again, this happens often. Yeah. The other day, I just felt not like myself. I just was feeling down. I was feeling depressed and yeah. I don't ever feel that way, yeah. you know, but again, it comes in like little, little waves, little, you know, little, sprinkles. little teeny yeah. waves, but it's amazing to me that what I've done is that I've just kept being intentional in conversation to others, even when I'm in a bad mood or even when I'm not feeling the best. And then all of a sudden it, it you come out of it because <laughs> You're ignoring the feeling that you have and you're doing something regardless of your feeling. So then all of a sudden it, it corrects itself. But if I stayed in my feelings, if I was like, I'm a, cause I've done that before. We've all, you know, I've stayed like, I'm just going to be in a bad mood today and I'm a grump and bite people's heads off. Yeah. And, and, and cause that's a decision. Of Listen, course. you can yeah. lie to yourself and say, oh, you were having a, you were having a bad day, but ultimately it's a decision to have a bad attitude, 100%. right? You can have a bad day, but having a bad attitude is a choice. Is it? Is it? And even if you have a migraine headache or you're sick or you didn't get any sleep, it's still a choice to be a dick, right? It's still a choice to be a bitch. Like yeah. that is a choice. Absolutely. And so I think by not choosing to have a bad attitude, you end up feeling better you end up on the other side of your feelings. And that's something that I think I've done a decent job of lately. I certainly, again, I yeah. am, you know, probably a lot of people that interact with me, I could see my brother being like, you don't do that all the time. But, <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm certainly not perfect with it, but the older I get, I, I think that's what it's about. It's about just not living in your feelings. And that's another thing too, like your highs often too, like don't, don't let the the real like high moments also be too high, right? Like yes. don't yes. be living in like, oh, I feel so good, you know, and just 100%. kind of like not being intentional because with then, that either. Then you kind of chase that dragon of that that elevated serotonin and dopamine. And 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 one thing that I will say is is getting in contact with like daily prayer, you know, no matter what your theology or ideology is, knowing that there is a God and God lies within all of us, whether it be the Holy Spirit, whether it be, you know, the traditions of Buddhism, whether it be Judaism and, and the Kabbalistic texts, having that daily prayer and conversation with source, with God, with the universe is so imperative to dig down deep and also know that there is someone up above who is divinely orchestrating your path and plan in life. And what it does is it transmutates anxiety and it gives you grace, faith, and it gives you hope and optimism. And it takes otherwise an anxious, nervous state, kind of like how I woke up this morning before I prayed, before I went to yoga, um, and then immediately transmutates it from a nervous energy to an excitement and an enthusiasm. I think that is one of the biohacks and one of the most imperative skill sets. So being able to change your mindset, right? And keeping a positive mental attitude, no matter what variable outside of your control is affecting you externally, A, having that connection with God and the wisdom of surrendering to God and letting him use you as a vessel for his divine purpose. And then B is like knowing how to just boom, like a toggle switch. Like if you're a jet pilot, you'd flip the afterburners to get a little more, you know, thrust. Uh, doing that when you're feeling low energy and maybe inside your emotions, hitting that toggle switch and transmutating those emotions from a state of anxiety or depression to a state of exalted enthusiasm and excitement. And if you can do that or do those three things, man, there's nothing yeah. really you can't overcome. Enthusiasm is something that I think people lack <laughs> and it's like yeah. i i have a hard time understanding why we are not more enthusiastic about life yes. in general we get one if you're on this alive thing if gift. your eyes open your feet hit the ground you have air in your lungs yeah and you have this thing of this gift of life why are you not enthusiastic about your your interactions your job you know another thing too is like your job it's not who you are, but everyone out there that has a job, first of all, should be, should be encouraged by that, 
should be grateful for it. But I say this all the time to my staff. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're the janitor, the coach, the CEO, whatever, you should want to be the very, the absolute best yes. version of that job title that you can be because don't ever minimize the impact that you can have on a company or on the customers or what have you. And I believe it starts with enthusiasm because enthusiasm is contagious. And if you have enthusiasm with the things that you do, then all of a sudden people are recognizing you for picking up that piece of paper, for wiping down the equipment, for doing the little things that otherwise, but if you like, if you're doing it and you're grunting and like, you know, rolling your eyes or what have you, then people are going to let you and be like, nah, I don't want it. I don't want it. But if you're doing yeah. it with enthusiasm, they're going to look at you and be like, there's something about that person. You know, I've gotten so many jobs throughout my life, you know, like lowly positions, being the bus boy at a restaurant, you know, just by sheer enthusiasm and positivity, like bussing tables enabled me to then get recognized by the security crew when I was 17 years old. You saw, you know, not only my stature, but also how I treated people, my enthusiasm and my excitement to work in a diligent pace. And for 17 years, it's enabled me to have a career in, in security and executive protection and is enabling me to facilitate the conversation we're having now. So and I, that I think that's very positive. Like, yes. I think you need to repeat that. Because yeah. People out there, young men, young men need to understand, stop waiting for some massive opportunity because actually the just getting an opportunity is, is your biggest opportunity. The biggest like, opportunity. Get your foot in the door, get in the room and start somewhere. Yes. And then bust your ass for that and Pete, you will be recognized. And the Absolutely. fact that you said you started out as a bus boy and then a security guy recognized your effort, that's how you go far in life. Like that's, that's a, it's, you nailed it on the head. It's right? that little tipping point, but it goes down to energy and, and like your, your spirituality and, and the way that you make people feel in your presence is everything. everything. The way that you exude energy in a positive fashion or negative fashion and the way that you carry yourself in a positive demeanor and a smiling visage or a frown literally will dictate the entire discourse and outcome of your life. 100%. Your attitude is reflected in your body language first. That's another thing too. Like men, pull your shoulders back, chest, chest up, up shoulders look back. people in the eyes, yes. Give them shake a firm people's handshake. hands. It's like a lost art. I don't understand yeah. why people, uh, you know, and it's, we're seeing it more and more and more. They don't shake your hand with, with a firm handshake. They don't look you in the eye. They're, they're looking all around. They're, they're slouched. I call it the moping syndrome. Yes. Like we have so many men and I wouldn't even call them men. I would call them boys yeah. that are just moping through life. Like stop. It, yeah. it, it's not contagious. It's not flattering. It's not something that's going to help you s with success and young teenagers, young men, young boys, you need to walk in a room and be seen. You do not need to walk in a room and fold your shoulders and, and you know. And, oh, and, oh. And, and this goes out to our female audience too. I, I warn you, we warn you about those men. Just because he's got the Richard Millie on his wrist just because he's, Wait, he's you call it? the richard milley the richard is that Mello. like the rolex it's it's, it's like the, the the don juan capitan okay. of wrist watches right. you know it's What's it's, it a, called? it's a million dollar piece and uh, a richard milley but <laughs> you, 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 have, you have a lot of individuals and and females and males that solely gravitate towards individuals for their materialism or their net worth or what they drive or or where they live and they have these conceptions of really what what a male is based on maybe their their materialistic successes what a male is and, and an alpha male is the person who on a saturday night at mila gives respect and acknowledgement to the to the young girl who's handing out the towels when everyone else walks past her and acts as if she's this untouchable peasant and they're this elitist individual who thinks they can treat people a certain way because they have power and titles and opulence that's not an alpha male that's the antithesis of of, of what a male should be a male should be a charismatic uh crusader of the light and someone who treats everyone he encounters with respect dignity and 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 humanity until 
someone draws a line on the sand and they operate under the guise of, you know, tyranny, oppression, or putting someone in a physical or emotionally compromised state. Right. And then at that point, you draw that Excalibur from that scabbard and you give them the option, you know, to either modify the behavior or, 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 or duel with you on site. And we've lost that as human beings, as males. Everyone's quick to, to, to talk shit, but when it comes down to getting hit, they either run the opposite way or they lawyer up. And we live in a very disingenuous society where people have this fictitious sense of safety. Um, and it's those same people that talk down to people. It's those same people that take kindness for weakness. It's the same people that get into abusive relationships. It's the same people that ask God for what it can give or what God can give them or what people or society can give them to self-serve and self-aggrandize rather than asking the question on a daily basis with a heart full of gratitude, how can I be of service to humanity? How can right. I be of service to God? How can I be of service to my country, my family? And that's another concept I think we need to change and people need to 100%. recognize more. No, that was a, that was well said. Be an asset, not a liability. Amen. Like, uh, you know, be a, participator not a spectator you know and build people up do not break people down amen and then you know that that i think that's a good one too is the fact that everyone is going through a tough battle like everyone has shit that they have to deal with whether yes. it's they're in a bad relationship they have a crappy job and or they you know they're sick they're injured they're they're in pain or what have you and and you never know what someone's going through and you never know what a what a small gesture what a a hug a a, a handshake a look in the eye that could change their trajectory and that's something i think we we uh miss out on a lot especially like strangers when you when you meet new people i mean what a what a fascinating thing, right? That there's what seven billion people on on Earth, and I mean, to me, that's that's it, it's almost mind-boggling. But to meet a stranger, to me, is like one of the coolest things that we can do as humans. And how are you leaving that person? You know, are they are you leaving them better than you found them? And if you're not leaving them better than you found them, then like, you know, what are you doing with your life? I, I was uh, leaving actually the UFC event, um, 287, which hats off to Dana, hats off to, to, to everyone that ran that operation flawlessly. Um, incredible, incredible, incredible experience and, and just a beautiful showing of patriotism and, and free-minded ideals. Uh, but as I was leaving to go back to my vehicle in the parking deck, I, I saw a young man, probably about 16, 17 years old with a dejected, slumped over posture. And he was picking up the garbage in the parking deck and um, just kind of sweeping up. And you can tell like, you know, he was feeling devalued, maybe feeling like, you know, it's 2 a.m. and here I am just this lowly dude picking up garbage. You know, you could tell he wasn't of means. and. I went up to him and I was like, hey, man, like you killed it tonight. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, dude, don't think for a second that your job is any less important than the person who's running this entire event. Like your job is of meaning and significance. And the parking deck looks great, brother. Like you're doing a freaking phenomenal job. And he looked up and he like kind of smiled. And it was so <laughs> funny. And like five minutes later, I got a phone call from my boy, Brian, Unbreakable Warren. He's had over 60 professional fights. He's also a pastor. And he saw me. And I didn't realize he saw me. Him and his wife, Gina, dear friends of mine. She's a pastor as well. And uh, he's like, dude, I saw what you did, G. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I saw you light up that kid's soul and spirit just by acknowledging his presence, just by probably for the first time all night, treating right. him with humanity, not treating him with someone who's subservient or less than, treating him as an equal. And that's what I ask everyone to do. Yeah. Because right? you never know what battles people are going through in the space between their own ears. And just that common gesture of humanity and humility could change the discourse of the rest of their life. 100%. Such a positive, yeah. positive, impactful way. Leave people better than you found them. That's that's an amazing story. Um, so I know recently uh, you've taken on some new, some new uh, like ventures or what have you. Yes. What is your next kind of? Uh, you know, adventure. <laughs> so, so yeah, next, next adventure, um, from an entrepreneurial standpoint is, is really building the brand of, of GTH consulting group, okay. um, LLC, which, uh, is, is a full service risk mitigation firm, um, for a global, uh, audience and, and, and demographic. Um, but with that starting to bring real world defensive tactics, not only to executive protection and private security professionals, as well as military and law enforcement personnel, but also bringing it into the home 
homes of families that want to safeguard their children. Families who want the confidence of knowing that if their son or daughter is in a situation, they have the means and the know how to defend themselves. Taking the executive experience that I've learned through global executive protection operations and giving it in a palatable form for everyone from the young kindergarten child all the way up to the corporate executive and everyone in between. So that they have the skill sets to assess an environment, do, do a risk analysis, um, know the port and entries and exits of wherever they're at, know how to study basic human or human intelligence and behavior patterns uh, or variables that are outside of the normal um, wavelength or baseline so that they can assess and figure out if there's a danger or imminent threat in their environment and cipher um, so that they can safeguard themselves so that we can help combat the rates of human trafficking and abductions and kidnappings and senseless violence you know from there i want to roll out a you know curriculum here in miami dade and then make it national where we can teach bully proof campaigns and teach uh, elementary school kids defensive tactics martial arts jujitsu boxing to empower themselves but then also to to eliminate bullying to, to eliminate you know the notion of ego or the notion of controlling someone if you've been humbled out on the jujitsu mats or in the dojo chances are you're not going to be a bully because you know what it's like to, to get right. beat up the people that I know that are the most proficient in violence or combat or defensive tactics are some of the most kind, gracious, humanitarian minded people I've ever met. And I really want to broadcast that message and empower others with that ability. That's amazing. Oh, that was really good. Um, what, uh, based off of that, what do you think that's something that we could apply to, uh, these school shootings? Absolutely. Because when, listening to you talk, it, I was literally saying in my head, like, this needs to be applied to every yeah. you know, school. So, so we have a, a homeless veteran population and, 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 and crisis. Um, we also have a, a, a crisis of, and it stems from a twofold thing. You know, the military does a great job training our soldiers for combat, mm -hmm. but they do a very poor job of helping them transition out of combat or out of the military and the armed services. Um, a huge, you know, defensive safeguard is to have you know, a military personnel outside of our schools, outside of our churches, outside of our synagogues as a force multiplier and as, as a presence um, and show of force to deter any coward active shooter that may want to target a weak point of, you know, interest, a, a soft target, so to speak, a place right. where there's multiple points of entry and exit, a place where there's no armed presence, a place where there's innocent women and children who might not know how to defend themselves. So A, having an armed person who is ready to engage any and all threats, and furthermore is able to deter threats from actually invading that, that, that property, that structure, that school. Um, B, training teachers and students alike how to respond to an active shooter scenario if it does take place, giving them standard operating procedures to essentially know what to do, how to lock doors, how to safeguard yourself. Um, thirdly, uh, eliminating multiple points of entry and exit, have one point of entry, one point of exit, and have screening and, and some sort of, if there's a guest, if there's a visitor, who isn't a student or isn't a parent or isn't a teacher, like make sure they go through a security checkpoint right. and they're properly screened. Um, and then and then fourth, like teaching teachers basic TECC, tactical emergency casualty care, giving them ability to know how to stop a bleed, giving them the ability to stuff a gunshot wound and, and find an arterial bleed, pack it and eliminate blood loss. You know, keep blood in students, teachers, so that no one bleeds out because that's the majority of the deaths are related to, to people bleeding out. Right. Because people that are there don't know basic first aid or, or TECC type training. Um, and then training, you know, local law enforcement to respond with quick, swift and, and, and violence of action so that if there is a threat, they don't post up outside like they did in Yolvati. Right. and enable 22 innocent women and children to get slaughtered. So those are some stratagems to kind of combat the school shootings. But I think from like a, a psychological and physical and emotional standpoint is empowering kids who are disenfranchised, empowering kids who come from broken homes um, with, you know, basic code of morals, basic code of how to treat others, basic ethos on how to be a good citizen. 
and, and not to bully people or not to pick on others or not to take your vitriol and hatred out on the people in your class. Um, you know, my first fight, man, was, was against a kid. I'll, I'll, I won't say his name. Uh, I don't want to ostracize him, but, uh, you know, we had a Hispanic, um, student in our class who didn't speak the language. He was from Guatemala and first generation. Um, and was constantly picked on by this certain individual who was a pretty big kid. He like was a naturally pretty built five-year-old. This is kindergarten. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just would vehemently attack uh, my buddy William. And, uh, you know, because he didn't look like the rest of us and he spoke a different language. And so one day I cornered this, this individual, I'll call him A, just to, you know, keep confidentiality. I cornered A in the bathroom. I grabbed him. I actually put him in one of those urinals and literally threatened him to make a ur eat a urinal cake if he ever so much as uttered a glance or mean word to, to my buddy William again. And as soon as I did that, I got attacked by the principal and the vice principal. Not the most strategical uh, plan on my part because it was right across from the principal's office, but <laughs> I had no other bathroom to access. And I get pulled off. And, and as I'm getting pulled off, I, I'm like, man, all I was doing was sticking up for this dude. But because I was a bigger kid at that time, I got in trouble. Mm -hmm. So it, it planted in my mind, like, as a young five-year-old, like, wait a minute, I was standing up for justice or injustice and I got punished by it. Like, there's a confusion there. I think part of the reason why people don't stick up for other kids that are picked on or bullied is because they don't want to get in trouble themselves. Right. So like changing that concept and making it known across the board that it is not acceptable to pick on someone for any reason, you know, right. it doesn't matter race, color, creed, religion, sexual orientation, treat people like a human being, treat right. people with respect and, and utilize the golden rule treat people how you want to be treated, man. And like, that should be just common knowledge, right? but it's a lost art. It's a it lost really philosophy. Is. So, really like impressing upon the youth of America and globally mm -hmm. that that very concept so that people aren't oppressing others but right. they're they're loving and building others not breaking them down what'd you think about uh I think Florida if I'm not mistaken they just uh changed the law with guns and said that like you don't even need a permit now like, so <laughs> what are your thoughts on that because I, yeah, I feel like it's a little it's it's a little uh, wild I, wild west it's yeah not, so so, so I think um, I, I'm, I'm a huge, you know, constitutional, um, you know, supporter. Um, but at the same time, I, I think there's a lot of people who have firearms and, and who carry firearms who aren't properly trained in the use of firearms. And what I'll say is kind of like a driving license requires exactly. you to take driver's right. ed. I think getting a pistol permit should require you to get some sort of in-depth training to know the operations of safely utilizing and operating a firearm effectively. It's kind of common sense. It's, it's common like sense. Yeah. For yeah. Making people get a driver's license, why wouldn't we make them get a gun license? Like it's Exactly. It's a little weird. So Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm in accordance with that. From a safety that. standpoint, I think it's very important. Yes. And um what what uh and there's plenty of places out there, right? That you can go get Absolutely. proper training and proper Ab safety. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Sheepdog Response, Tim Kennedy's organization is a great one. Um, we've got some great organizations down here in uh, in Florida. And, and being a very Second Amendment pro state, you know, you have access to very well uh, trained cadres of instructors who can get you dialed in and get you confident and comfortable in the operations of a firearm so that you can safeguard yourself and your family right. and, and and honestly innocent members of society uh when when soft targets are attacked by active shooters they don't conceptualize the invariable threat of an armed member of society with a concealed carry weapon uh there was that shooting was it two years ago in Texas where there was an individual who stormed the uh, the pastor in a church in Texas and there was a member of the parish who engaged the threat, neutralized it by putting two effective round center mass and was able to save the entire church. Wow. So like these cowards who engage in shootings pick strategically churches, schools, hospitals, mental health centers, places that they think are soft targets. Right. You know, so we need to fortify those places even more. Yeah. Right? I mean, I've never understood why we have, you know, we have guards out in front of almost every single bank, you know, but not in front of schools and not that's in front of hospitals. guarding money materialists. Yeah. Why aren't we guarding, guarding the lives, lives of our children? Like, yeah. You know, the most precious commodity. Point, there's plenty of veterans that need work, employment, and need 
uh, a need purpose, right? Yes. And I, I think that would be, uh, if, you know, if I, if I was in a position that that would be one of the first things I would do Hundred percent is, uh, you know, get, get a lot of people involved in that, in that movement. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's help roll it out together. You know, there's, Something there's so much opportunity be, there. So, um, what would you, what would you say is your, your biggest takeaway from like coming out of what we all just went through in the pandemic? What, what was like one of the, the main take home messages that, that, that you walked away with? Self-reliance, the, the notion that, again, we're the master and commanders of our fate, of our souls, of our families. Um, we are the bastions and the protectors of a free and orderly society. And we are the front line and first responders between the goodness of humanity and the evil perpetrators who are trying to commit evil, heinous action on those individuals. So knowing how to use both your hands and, and limbs to effectively defend and protect, you know, those not only that you know and care about, but also, you know, disenfranchised members of society mm -hmm. and, and those weaker members of society, right? Um, and then also getting proficient in firearms, getting proficient in basic armed combatives, knowing how to operate, you know, a firearm effectively, knowing how to throw a basic jab cross combination, knowing how to block a jab cross, knowing how to, if you get locked up or someone puts you in a body lock, defend against that scenario from a grappling standpoint. Um, and then also learning basic life skills, like learn how to change the oil in your car, learn how to change a tire, learn how to, you know, operate a ham radio, learn how to grow your own food, learn how to fish, learn how to hunt. You know, these are all vital skills as, as you know, resources become more and more scarce. You know, you can't rely on anyone else but yourself. And you have to be a member of society who literally can help sustain life learning first aid, learning how to, you know, keep people alive, learning how to, you know, if, if someone gets shot or stabbed, stop the bleed. You know, if you're walking through the mall and someone literally bleeds out in front of you, how horrible and how haunted would you be if you didn't do anything because you didn't know or because fear overtook you mm. and you didn't have the skill sets to perform basic first aid or med medicinal, you know, uh, practice, right? Of a tourniquet or, or, or stuffing a wound. So like, I think that stuff became ever more and more important. Yeah. And I know my focus narrowed and rarefied towards those skill acquisitions. Yeah, I saw that in you during that time. I mean, for me, it was like, one of my biggest takeaways was choosing confrontation over convenience. Yes. And I thought that too many men, too many people in general were choosing convenience and the easy, uh, just like ignoring basic fundamental rights because yeah. they were avoiding confrontation. confrontation. Yes. They didn't want to put themselves in a position where they're having to argue with someone or, or challenge someone. And for me, from the very start of it, I asked questions, I challenged everything. Yes. Because again, it goes back to my intuition. You know when you just, you know. You know. You know. Yeah. And for me, as soon as it all started, I knew something was, something was off. Absolutely. Like this was not, not the, normal. The, like the, the, the pandemic the, was yeah, exactly it was, that. It was very uh, orchestrated to yes. say the least. Yes. And uh, I just, I wasn't, um, I wasn't willing to not engage in confrontation. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was going to challenge the status quo. Like, yes. You know, and, and, and I was going to ask lots of questions and I was going to get uncomfortable. And, and that was just something that I did from day one. And, and I think it made our community stronger. I think it made myself stronger. I think that we came out of that in, in in a in a tremendous way because of the stance of freedom that we chose. And I, I just a big believer in freedom and faith over yes. over fear. Over you know, fear. You cannot yep. live with fear. And no. if you're a believer, then you have to really look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, like, am I living in fear? Or am I living in by faith? Yes. And if you're not living by faith, then you got to question your beliefs yeah. a little bit, you know? And so I think 
it's something that we all need to recognize because it will come back and this will happen again and fool me once but let me tell you something if we do not recognize what we just went through and we don't not and we don't respond differently then it will be way worse, be way worse. the second time around. yeah and i think all of us as a society need to push back and and stand on the the foundation of freedom you know of what Absolutely. it really means yes you know so yeah something that uh i don't know i i, I think that me and you like we really saw that eye to eye from day one. Absolutely. And, and, and many people, like uh, there were so many people that believed the same thing, but yeah. yet were, you know, yeah. locked up in a room and yeah. not talking about it. Yep. So. Shout out to my buddy, Mitch Aguiar from Massive Supplements and, and Violent Hippie, who literally, you know, helped use his platform to expose truth, who exposed, you know, kind of the false narratives and uh, was fearless in doing so. I think... You know, we go back to the American Revolution. I was just at Harvard University and I was at their um, school of business. And, and essentially, um, the founding fathers, you know, these were opulent, highly intellectual men who created this free thinking society to eradicate the tyrannical rule of King George III and the oppression that he imposed on them you know, uh, post the French and Indian war as a way to punish them and basically get them to pay reparations, um, for the conflict. And they had everything to lose. They, they had a lot more to lose than the average American, Mm. uh, who speaks out now. They, they had, you know, estates, they had their lives. I mean, if you went against King George the third, you were literally hanged as a treasonous member against the crown. So what I'll say is, you know, you need to be able to to risk essentially a a metric ton to fight for the convictions and the beliefs of faith and freedom. And and if you don't, you are literally regressing back into the tyrannical pitfall of slavery. And and that's what people don't realize, how close we are to that, that cliff of tyrannical slavery mm-hmm. and we got to hold the line like this and we got to pay attention to history and we got to like pay attention to history it's right it's yeah history is right there yeah like those who don't learn got, from it are doomed history. to repeat it you yeah, have to learn 100%. from it you have to learn from it and we've seen countries fall into this and if we don't pay attention to it we'll be right right next to it precisely so i feel like yes i obviously have a voice and i obviously have a platform but i think men like yourself uh what you've been through where you've gone what you've seen uh your friends yes your 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 colleagues y'all for you guys to speak up it it just you're you're speaking from you're validated like you're you're speaking from a, a a respect a respected platform yes you know like like you know what you're talking about and i I think that uh i mean of course i can speak on it from just like like a business owner a Mm -hmm. citizen but when you're speaking on it from firsthand experience when you're speaking on it from you've been in the trenches and you've seen what uh tyrants look like and and Mm -hmm. it's just it, it to me it's a very powerful platform and uh and it would be well received because of how you're respected so and and bringing people on who have that that subject matter expert to 100 ex- yeah degree, like and, and just especially like these rangers and, and yeah Green 100 Berets and 100%. navy seals and, yep i mean people that really know yeah. what the heck been, been down yeah. range exactly. and, and know what what infringements of freedom look like exactly in in countries that we're much like the United States up until 20 years ago. Right. Look at Venezuela, you I know, mean, Venezuela is with, a, with Hugo Chavez and the rise of example. him and Maduro and, and now how socialism and communism has completely stripped those people of everything. You know, I was in Colombia, I was in Bogota and, you know, you see the, literally they, they, they make bags and they make all of these artistically beautiful gifts that people buy out of the Venezuelan dollar because it has no value anymore. It's completely been devalued. So, so to go back to what we were talking about, like what has COVID shown the world and exposed? Um, I think one of the most important things obviously is self-reliance, right? Being able to farm, fish, fight, 
forage, fix people if they get injured, right? All those essential kind of Fs of, of life and preserving life. Um, and then the financial component. So we'll yes. say the six Fs, right? Uh, and with that being said, um, knowing how to organize a tribe of like-minded individuals and knowing kind of like the Green Berets do, how to create key leader engagement and train people up to the point where, okay, this guy is our comms guy. This guy is our videographer. This guy is our tack man. He's going to, you know, if someone gets shot or injured, he's going to patch them up and fix them and keep them alive. This guy's our sniper. Like how you build out a team in the special forces community, which is something I've learned from operating with these individuals, um, is that um, every purpose or every person has a purpose and, and giving that person a purpose elevates their potential to the highest level possible. If you have something that you know you have to be a subject matter expert in, it amplifies your intensity, it amplifies your focus, your discipline, all aspects improve because you know you're a vital component to that team. Right. And if you drop the ball, like someone could die, someone could right. get killed. I think we need to apply those principles to life in general from the family structure of a nuclear family and outward. Because let's be honest, they've wanted to destroy the nuclear family. They've wanted to spread fear over faith they want to rapture and fracture a relationship with god yeah. it's up to us to fortify that and fight back and 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 to really build strong families to raise the next generation of inspired free-thinking men and women to give them the gift of god's grace to educate them in worldly doings and happenings and give them the basic pillars of bushido honor integrity justice doing what's right when no one's watching especially when no one's around or watching and giving them the skills to to know how to, if something happens to mom or dad or something happens in society where they're left alone, knowing how to keep themselves alive because we can't cripple the minds and the abilities. We need to foster and build the minds and abilities. And we now live in a society where people try to cripple or clip the wings of those members of that society mm -hmm. for control, for oppression. It's way easier to control someone when they don't have a gun. It's way right. easier to control someone when they're living in a state of panic and fear and hysteria. Yep. Yep. And you take their voice away too. Yeah. You know, we don't have freedom of speech. There's something wrong with that. Um, the censorship stuff's out of control. It is. Absolutely is. Uh, let's talk about a little bit let's about water, talk shall about we? About high quality so, H2O. NDO H2O. I uh, introduced you to this a while back. And uh, obviously it's, it's uh, we can even use the word passion for this because it's definitely yes. a passion project that I'm, means a lot. But I think for me, you know, the gym business is, is phenomenal and things are going well, but I, I really love being involved in uh, a product now that can reach on a global scale. Absolutely. I think that I've always envisioned no days off to be my pay it forward moment. No days off to be synonymous worldwide where people in India, when they say no days off and they see the pit bull, they, they know what it means that they're becoming the best version of themselves, that they're not taking a day off on life. And I think through this message of, of, of premium water coming out with something that's going to be, uh, you know, the premium water category has not been, really touched in, in, in decades. No. Uh, if you look at the Aquapanas, the Perriers, the Saratogas, the uh, uh, Pellegrinos, it's basically been just the Fijis, the Voss. It's, they really haven't done much innovation. It's no. just been that, that's, that's the fancy water. That's the premium water. And I think that as uh, liquid death disrupted the uh, normal water category and, and, and kind of was the first uh, craft water to come out. I think it really opened the door to craft waters and we want to be a category disruptor in the premium space and the luxury space and, and really bring a product that we can stand by, um, what's in the can that we really, really care about what we're putting into people's bodies. So we're, we're, we're painstakingly uh, goes through a seven step process of purity process. And then we, we hand picked a proprietary blend of electrolytes to go back into the can to give it the taste and the function. And then more importantly than even what's in the can 
is the message outside the can and, and how you can apply it to your life and that you can carry this can and it's like a badge of honor. Yes. Like, you know, like when people see it, you can proudly say that you're drinking it because you believe in not only what's in it, but you believe what comes from it. And what comes from it is a community of like-minded people that have been living a no days off lifestyle for, for the last 15 years and applying it to their relationships, applying it to their businesses, applying it to their, uh, to, uh, their, their children, applying it to, to their lives. And if you ask anyone in our community, you know, what does no days off mean to you? You'll hear several different versions of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the power of it is that no days off can mean something differently for everybody, but ultimately it's about what, how is it inspiring you to become a better version of yourself? And if how, whatever that looks like for you, whether that's through yoga or through Pilates or through, you know, a uh, legacy or through boxing or through martial arts and jujitsu or through, uh, philan uh, philanthropy through, through whatever that Avenue is, you know, th this is something that you can like hold with pride. And, and that's something that means a lot to me is that I want, I want to not, you know, I, I want a, a non-controversial thing that people can just rally behind and can spread this like wildfire. You know, water is, water is, I mean, you would say water is water, but water is not water. Not all waters are created equal. I think we're seeing that now. We've 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 tested ours up against uh, all the waters out there, and it's fascinating to see uh, the different mineral content that our waters are superior than other waters, and and the taste. I mean, I'm telling you right now, it took us a year and a half to uh, develop the taste. We were, we were very intentional in how it tasted. We we paid attention to the mouth feel. Um, I, I feel like uh, we had a, a very similar like S sommelier kind of kind of approach to it. And um, it, it really it's, it's fascinating because if you drink our water for long enough and then you go back to drinking something else, you can immediately taste the difference. Like yes. you really can. And we're, we're you know, we're, our job now is to really educate the public and the distributors and the store managers and the gyms and the yoga studios on why our water is better. And, uh, I know you've experienced it. So tell me a little bit about like your experience with it. Yeah, it's, it's a, like the can is extremely well designed. It's, it's an imagery that conveys power. It conveys strength. It's, it's a beautiful visage of one of my favorite creatures, which is the American pit bull, a loyal, loving, often misunderstood dog. Yeah who I spent a lot of time in New York working at a place called Rough House Rescue, which is a pit bull rescue that used to save dogs from kill shelters. So we do uh, charity benefits to basically raise money so that we would hear about a dog in Alabama who was used as a bait dog or a fighting dog. And we would get the proceeds to basically, you know, fly down, grab the dog and bring him back to, to, to Rough House Rescue and then get him adopted. And so my role was like a little bit fundraising, but a little bit of like just socializing with a creature of, many pit bulls and they're amazing amazing lovely dogs and uh it's funny man i had this experience i was i was dating this girl who you know in a lot of ways turned out to be kind of a soulless devil woman and uh, i was walking this pit bull and uh beautiful pup like dark obsidian coat like loved him man super super chill and we we're walking around the block and the girl that i was dating was like maybe a block away and as soon as she started to turn my direction this pup both ears pointed up looked back hair raised and just got into this like fighting defensive posture <laughs> and i should have followed the intuition yeah and right? wisdom he was of this you know dog she was who crazy. was letting me know she <laughs> yeah. was cray cray and like i should probably run for the hills uh and i didn't dogs don't lie <laughs> and dogs do not lie they're the amazing amazing creature but uh aside from my affinity for dogs in the american pit bull and the imagery that this uh endorses um yeah no days off is a commitment to yourself like I just got fresh ink, man, right? So I haven't been able to lift the last two days. Fantastic, I, I appreciate brother. it, brother. <laughs> I, I did yoga today, but I haven't been able to really do anything forceful and I'd love to train jujitsu, but obviously, you know, the risk of infection with the new tad is high. So no days off doesn't mean just getting to the gym. No days off means optimizing yourself in all aspects. So if you can't work out because you have an injury, read a book. If you can't read a book because you have a stigmatism, you know, 
listen to an audible of, of self-improvement or how to scale a business from A to Z. Like no days off is not just in the physical realm. No days off is, is holding a sacred oath and commitment to yourself to improving your aspect of life in all facets, ways, and, and angles possible. So that A, yes, you can improve the life of yourself, but more importantly, you can improve the life of others around you and of society and leave a legacy and leave something that is worth remembering. Um, so to go back to the taste, um, proven purity, right? It's reverse osmosis, seven step process, central minerals and vitamins that help rehydrate you. Um, and you know, it's an optimal balance of pH. So, you know, gives you that kind of alkalinity that most other waters don't. Most other waters are acidic and right. they have high levels of plastics and heavy metals and impurities. And so you may think, oh, I'm drinking water or I drank a gallon today. Well, not all waters are created equal. So you may have just drank a gallon of rust water with heavy traces of iron and lead and arsenic contaminants, even. arsenic. There's arsenic. Yeah, rat poisoning. Literally, yes. you're consuming something that is meant to kill an invasive species and you're putting that in your body. And so you may not be satiating your thirst. You may be poisoning yourself. Right. And a lot of people do. And a lot of times in the summer heat, you're leaving a water bottle in the hot summer sun in your car. It's and baking. All bottles. those plastics are seeping into the water. Mm -hmm. And then you have no problem taking a scoop of pre-workout to the face and chasing it with that same bottle of liquid plastic and liquid carcinogen. This being in an aluminum can safeguards you from that. And I'll connect the dots here why this is important. I can't wait to bring this overseas and on um, you know, uh, disaster relief missions is that oftentimes the suppliers give plastic bottles out. You know, listen, wa some water is better than no water in the, in the state that the states that we go in where people are literally dehydrated and dying and you need to get some fluids. Right. But if we can start pushing this out in a global theater and getting it to people, I mean, it'll change their lives. It'll enable the young, you know, starving child in Africa who has no clean water source to, to for the first time in his life, get the ability to, to have that. And I posted a video. I don't know if you remember the video that I posted three days ago, and it was a young child and a missionary basically giving this child water out of his hands and for the first time bathing him in clean water. It's such a beautiful this, imagery. I'll, I'll it, send yeah. it to you. Um, but that is what I envision us doing with No Days Off. Yeah. Like literally bringing it. And I want to introduce you to Justin Wren, who builds wells in Africa for the pygmy people oh, and gives them fresh water sources. But then also bringing these canned, deliverable, premium sources of water to people of all walks, shapes, colors, sizes around the world, not just for the elites or the people that have money, but also for the people that don't have anything. Right. And for the first time in their life, they can have something that literally enables them to survive. So one of the things we're doing too, Amazing. that I know you'll appreciate is uh, we're actually giving 1% of gross revenue. So this is our, this is our uh, closed on Sunday Chick-fil-A moment yes. where we're actually giving 1% of gross revenue, not profits, to uh, second chance programs. Awesome. And it, it's very dear to uh, myself and my partners. And you know, we've already gotten pushback from, from our investors, uh, well, potential investors, obviously the ones that gave us pushback, they're not gonna be investors. Yeah, no. But uh, you know, they're like, oh, y'all are too young to be giving away profits you know, and giving away revenue. And ultimately, I don't see it like that. No. Ultimately, it's, it's very similar to me of why Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. And, uh, Chick-fil-A, if you look at, so they're the, they're the highest grossing fast food chain. Um, even though they're closed on Sunday, they, they actually do better than McDonald's and Burger King combined. Wow. And they're giving up over $300 million a year of revenue by being closed on Sundays, but they stay true to who they are and they don't, they don't sway their values and their integrity. And I believe I solely believe and I, I, I strongly believe that the reason why they are so successful is because of that. Yes. And I think that if you if you do things uh, only for success, if you do things only for money, then sometimes it can actually, you know, negatively backfire, impact, negative can backfire. Impact but if you yeah. stand on what your true values are and you stand on integrity and you do something uh, because it's the right thing to do then um, oftentimes that will 
that will come back to you Absolutely. and and then your value will will only increase and your significance will only increase you know and then the success will come it but will. um i i'm really uh encouraged by the platform of these beverages and like you said the 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 ability to do um more than just than just build a, a financially uh successful company but do something that really impacts the world yes um from a humanitarian standpoint from a sustainability standpoint and then also from a messaging standpoint because there's a mindset that this is going to carry and influence across a global you know initiative that i believe uh will be as strong as just do it you know yes. i think nike did a phenomenal job with just do it and what that really stood for and people really rallied behind it and uh and i think we were we we can have that that impact Absolutely. that same impact our three Absolutely. words no days off is is to me an extremely powerful thing especially in the right context one you know a lot of times people don't understand you you said it beautifully uh that no days off is not about working out of the grind and you know all this stuff it's actually about just not taking a day off ever you know whether you're going to the spa or whether you're taking your family to the beach or where you're taking your son to school like you got to do it with intention and pride and and you want to make the most out of it like don't just aimlessly go through life you know that that's not a way to live no no living intentionally and and, and not just going through the motions but making every habitual action a purpose driven experience with a heart full of gratitude and an atomical optimism is the surefire way to elevate your frequency and manifest the life beyond your wildest expectations and dreams. Yep, I agree. And it comes from intensity of training, intentionality, proper hydration, proper nutrition, and surrounding yourself, not always with like-minded individuals in the sense that just a bunch of yes men who tell you what you wanna hear, inspired individuals from all different walks of life and demographics, but individuals who have that same purposeful mission to be a force multiplier for good. And if you could do that on a regular basis, you're gonna make huge, massive ripple effects and waves in the world. Yep. <laughs> I often say, uh, surround yourself with people that make you feel uncomfortable. Yes. Because yes. those that make, and listen, I'll be honest, like sometimes you make me feel uncomfortable. Yeah, right back at you, know you brother. Like, right bro, back at like you, you're, dude. I'm you're like, a very damn. intense individual. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not a huge fan of close talkers. Sometimes you close talk me. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's a lot. Yeah, and, no, absolutely. And, and I love that. Yeah, though. like, yeah. But then it makes you, it make, it, it calls, and it, it's speaking to you in a totally different way. Yes. You know what I mean, it's speaking to that ego. Yes. Yes. Because we're both, you and know, I love like, that feedback, man. Mode yeah. And like, whatever. And, and, and it's, it's like, all right, this dude's six, three coming uh, yeah, at me, yeah, exactly. you know, like, but it's, so, it's back it's, up. Like, well, that's, <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's only for a place of love, but it's like two pit bulls sizing each other up exactly, on the yard. Exactly. It's funny actually. And it, and it makes sense. And actually on my, my left trap, I got, uh, the Sanskrit text of sacred silence, which has been a huge life lesson for me this year because I am hyper intense. I am, dude. <laughs> no, I'm, don't ever lose that. No, I know. I'm not going to lose it. But, but I it's also, exactly why I you're in the room, though. Socially and emotionally aware yeah. of my intensity. And sometimes dial it down, <laughs> other times dial it up. Uh, and, and then you know sometimes. I've taken no, and, and, on and, that. and I, 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 I love it, it dude. I love it. Um, and I'm the same way. That's why we grow because we're, we're, we're constantly seeking improvement. We're not, you know, we're humble enough to take the white belt approach in everything we do so that we're always learning, we're always growing. And and, and that is what will catalyze the greatest size of success and, and inspire others to have those same levels of success and hopefully greater. But um, yeah, I got sacred silence on Sanskrit tattooed on my left trap. My boy Thaddeus Gardner, Jason Gardner's brother, awesome dude. Um, tats a bunch of the SEAL team dudes and lives in San Clemente, California. So shout out to him. But I told him, I was like, dude, I literally sometimes don't know when to shut the hell up. And part of this journey the last year has been learning when to shut the hell up and speak less <laughs> and observe and listen more. So that has been a mission and, and it has served me very well. It yeah. absolutely has. I love but, it. But uh, yeah, dude, I'm, I'm as intense as it gets. But uh, you know what, dude? I love it's... it. I love it. Don't ever change that. Don't ever change that. That's a perfect ending right there. Yeah. So. <laughs>